Hello, I'm Alice Beer. Welcome to Health and HIV. Here at ITM Productions, we're thrilled to have teamed up with the British HIV Association for World AIDS Day 2020. <laughs> Coming up in this programme, we'll be finding out how former Wales rugby captain Gareth Thomas is tackling HIV stigma. Still often considered a gay man's disease, we hear from women living with HIV. Why living longer with HIV means planning ahead is more important than ever, and looking beyond the headlines as new figures reveal the diagnosis of HIV among gay and bisexual men in England dropped to their lowest level in 20 years. No longer the death sentence it was once thought to be, medical advancements mean far better outcomes for people living with HIV. To tell us more, the chair of the British HIV Association, Dr Laura Waters, joins me now. Laura, HIV treatment in the UK has been a phenomenal success, hasn't it? We should be celebrating this. We absolutely should. And as you've said, from the start of the HIV epidemic, when people were experiencing essentially a terminal illness, the advances in therapy have transformed the outlook, meaning most people with HIV have a normal life expectancy. And importantly, effective treatment means they cannot pass HIV on to their partners. Which treatments would you say have had the biggest impact? It's hard to pick a standout treatment. Now, I think the biggest advance was the mid-1990s when we started using combinations of drugs. Prior to that, drugs only yielded short-term benefits, but by combining treatments, we were able to get the virus undetectable and keep it undetectable. Now, most people are on treatment they take once a day. In the future, we will have injectable treatments, maybe next year, and ultimately things like implants, which may need changing only once a year, and people do not need to worry about taking tablets every day. Look, we've all been knocked backwards by uh, the pandemic. How, what have the implications been for people living with the HIV of COVID-19? So COVID-19 has had a huge impact on all health services, including HIV. Now that has meant doing clinics by telephone or video consultation. It has meant less monitoring because we don't want people coming to clinic for blood tests unless they're absolutely necessary. And of course, all of the anxiety associated with COVID that everybody has lived through. But thankfully, we've been able to maintain services and going forwards, there may be innovations that make HIV care better and more convenient for people living with HIV. HIV. It's almost like you've been silently working on this brilliantly behind the scenes because although treatments are hugely successful and results are brilliant, public awareness is lagging behind somewhat, isn't it? No, it is. I think partly that's due to the fact that HIV remains a relatively uncommon condition compared to other long-term conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure. But there's still a lot of stigma surrounding HIV. People don't like talking about sex. People don't talk about testing for sexually transmitted infections. And I think because of that, HIV just doesn't have the public awareness that it should. It's still surrounded by a massive stigma, isn't it? And I think because of that, people with HIV aren't necessarily confident to share their status with other people. There's a lot of outdated myths about risk of transmission. And only by equipping people with up-to-date knowledge can we help challenge that stigma to make testing for HIV and living with HIV a normal thing. For most of us, especially those of us over 40, HIV is intrinsically linked with that strong message that went out, don't die of ignorance in 1986. That was an incredibly hard hitting campaign. It was a hard hitting campaign for sure. I was 12 years old when the adverts with the icebergs and the gravestones and John Hurt's frightening narration appeared. Now we would never run a campaign based on fear and fear of HIV should never be a tool for prevention, but it probably did have an impact at the time in reducing new transmissions. 
We definitely need a new public health campaign, one that's based on fact and optimism rather than fear. But considering that was the last campaign we had, I think that is well overdue. So what would the message be of a new campaign? Any new campaign needs to be based on the positives, the normal life expectancy, the non-risk of transmission in somebody on treatment. Anybody who has had sex may be at risk of HIV. So everybody should test and know if they test, they can access treatment that will lead them to have a normal life. Dr Waters, thank you very much. While improvements in treatment and increased testing have helped to lower the number of new diagnoses of HIV in England, there is more to be done. A year ago, charities Terence Higgins Trust, National AIDS Trust and the Elton John AIDS Foundation joined forces to establish the world's first HIV commission, tasked with outlining a vision for ending new HIV transmissions and HIV attributed deaths in England by 2030. Joining me now from the HIV Commission are Chair Dame Inga Beale and campaigner Mercy Shebemba, along with MP Steve Brine. Dame Inga, that is a hugely ambitious goal, isn't it? Yes, and in fact, it was set out as a goal by Matt Hancock. And I was then asked if I would chair the HIV Commission, not really being an expert in HIV, but the more I learned about it, through these, the charities that you mentioned, the more I realized it's an absolute possibility. Now, despite having the means of testing and the drugs required to end the new transmissions, we know that this won't happen by accident, which is really the task um, of the commission. It was sort of to come up and say, right, what is that step change that's required? What do we need to do differently? And it's going to be a step change that requires a multiple collaborative effort right across the country. But I know if we get government committed and we get resources and people in place to take the action, I know that we can become the first country in the world to eliminate new HIV cases. Now, looking at the figures from uh, these new figures from public health, uh, England. There's obviously a decline in HIV diagnosis, especially amongst gay and bisexual men, but it is not as encouraging for heterosexuals, is it? It isn't. And this could be partly ignorance, people not knowing enough about it. Um, and this is why one of our key recommendations is testing, testing and more testing. And maternity testing is obviously key to that as well, isn't it? Yes, now that's a great example. I mean, it's the exemplar actually of what can be achieved if we have testing as normal. Testing coverage uh, for maternity services is at 99%. The testing is done, then the medical teams can, can take and make the right interventions ahead of the birth. So being a huge success, so let's learn from it. Mercy, being diagnosed as a child is not a demographic that's currently uh, commonly associated with HIV. Why did you decide to go public and tell your story? Yeah, because of exactly that. People don't realise it. And I know so many times when I've said, oh, that I was born with HIV, people are kind of like, oh, like I didn't realise that was a thing. Um, and I just wanted to give a voice and a platform to young people living with HIV to sh share our experiences of growing up with HIV because it's a completely different set of experiences um, and I think it's really important. Mercy, a lot of people won't go for testing, the kind of testing that the Commission is advocating because they dread what that diagnosis will bring with it. But you can be reassuring about that. Look, there you are leading a perfectly normal and you know, going forwards, long, happy, healthy life, can't you? So can you reassure people that testing is, is the beginning, not the end? Yeah, definitely. Um, I live a normal life just like everyone else. I've got a career that I love. I've got a marriage I love. Um, I get to live the life that I thought I was going to live when I was a child before I knew. Um, and actually, it's really important to get tested because then you know your t your status and you you can take the right action um, to you know get things sorted and work with a team to actually give you um, a yeah a better life. So the government backs your goal of ending HIV transmissions. What action, what on the ground action needs to be taken for you to achieve this by 2030? 
we've got a 20 point action plan coming out um, and it's a sort of comprehensive guide how we can get all of this collaboration working across the country and if we do it together we normalize HIV testing, we have it happening whenever you're visiting the doctor or AI, A&E or visiting a pharmacy, we can get that embedded and we know that we can achieve our, our goal of ending HIV by 2030. Mercy, tell me about the commission itself. What was it like to be part of that process? It was an honour, but it's also the way that things should be. You know, young people should be involved um, in this. The 2030 goal, we're definitely going to be around for it. But it was really amazing to be there as a person that was actually living with HIV. So in all of the conversations that we could have, I could be like, well, actually, that's what that's how this fits into my daily reality. And um, particularly when we went around the country and heard from other people living with HIV, it was really nice to be able to like, for that yeah for me to just be like yeah I, I'm gonna champion these guys because like this is my community um and I just learned how crucial it is that in our response going forward we don't just stick to cool like everyone in the HIV sector knows about this but nobody outside of us does but actually reaching across um the many different parts of society and saying actually we need to have involvement from the media we need to have involvement from religious groups and all of these kinds of things and um yeah it was amazing well you both have the enthusiasm and the energy to make this target happen uh does the government uh, thank you very much ladies um coming now to steve Bryan, mp for winchester what does the government need to do what do you need to do uh to make sure that this target is met so i think it's about going to be very ambitious but it's also going to be very difficult it's going to require a cross-government focus we're going to require department of health ministers cabinet office ministers to get together report to parliament every year so that we can account for how they're doing it's going to really require us to drill down into these numbers between now and 2025 for the first 80 percent so that we can then tackle the the harder to reach at the end so so for instance every interaction with the nhs at the moment where we take blood for instance we're not testing for hiv we need to change that nobody should go through a sexual health clinic without being tested for hiv and that's going to be difficult and i don't think we should shirk from that it's going to be controversial and it's going to require ministers and the health service to hold their nerve we've got a chance to really really make a difference and i think the public are very receptive to that right now so let's do this you know let let's hit our ambition of, of ending hiv transmissions by 2030 I, I think it's a great ambition i think we can absolutely do it and on that positive note, thank you very much, uh, Steve, and to Dame Inga and Mercy. Women make up a third of HIV cases in the UK and over 50% globally, yet women are underrepresented in terms of medical research, support and visibility. In this special report, women living with HIV speak out about how their experiences have shaped their lives and what change they want to see for a fairer future. HIV was first identified way back in the 80s and it was the gay guys in San Francisco who had this strange thing, didn't know what it was. Contrary to popular belief, HIV is certainly not just a gay man's disease. Worldwide, there are more women than men who are living with HIV. To the surprise of most people I meet, I live with HIV. I don't fit the pattern they have in their head. The automatic reaction is, I'm so sorry. To which I say, why? I'm fine. And they say, but you're so brave with tears in their eyes, and I say, I'm not brave, I'm absolutely fine. I'm really lucky because I go to a really good clinic, the Lawson Clinic in Brighton, where there is, in fact, a special service for women, and I'm spoilt by my doctor, Yvonne Gillies. So I've been working in the field of HIV for 25 years now, and over that time, we have developed really good drug treatments for HIV meaning that now somebody diagnosed with HIV is unlikely to die from HIV, but stigma, which does exist, can kill. There are 38 million people living with HIV worldwide, of whom nearly 21 million are women. 
Historically, women have been underrepresented in clinical trials, meaning we don't really know how HIV drugs uh, behave differently in women. And women's representation in trials has ranged from between 15 and 25 percent. However, data presented this year at an international conference was really disappointing to show that actually there were fewer women represented in the trials this year than had been in previous years presented. So there are 100,000 people living with HIV in the UK. One third of the individuals living with HIV in the UK are women. And of those women, the majority are of black and ethnic minority background. Women, HIV and research, we are not centred and our experiences aren't captured enough. So it means that there are a lot of unanswered questions for women living with HIV. For example, what are ex our experiences going to be like as we grow older? And what are some of the impacts of taking the medication for as long as we have? A couple of years ago now, I was in a healthcare setting where the person who was looking after me just assumed that I wouldn't want to have children because I have HIV. And their assumption was really was really challenging because in certain spaces you just want the healthcare professionals to get it right. I was diagnosed with HIV just over 20 years ago and I was completely shocked because I really thought that HIV was just a disease that affected gay men. What made it worse for me was that my boys were only five and seven at the time, and I was told I only had about seven years to live. Knowledge is incredibly important to me, so I made it my mission to find out everything that I could about HIV. One of the things that's really helped me to deal with my diagnosis is connecting with other women living with HIV. There are support services across the UK who can help you, who understand what you're going through. I made a lot of amazing friendships and I honestly feel like I've gained a second family. In Zimbabwe, more than 74,000 children and adolescents are living with HIV. Antiretroviral medicines are life-changing for those infected, but treatment alone is sometimes not enough. AfriCAID, a community-based organisation, runs a programme led by adolescents, all of whom are living with HIV themselves, who support other young people with an HIV diagnosis and help them lead happy and healthy lives. Pandras was status young and the canoe test coach pattern and is in the guns and the HIV positive. Panguan guns of Shati was singing in the guns as gum cheer. So Dum Danga Road Zangdegan and Chinese can she don't go to Penuangua, Wagum and Nazuns and Jacquansa quit as his own. The HIV positive. As Pandras one or Batro of my kids, the Kwansa Gunazo gum cheer, status young to Jenus no one in Kamuram. Paris, you know, Dangaro Zangwa, Sinana, Genesis, Nondinet, Panesi, send out to Fungam Nesaganak, I'm sure Gang Dagnozaganak, out of Nangua, Nazi in the Kamneskanak, Pasnana Dambudzik. Just like Liosa, there are 74,000 adolescents living with HIV in Zimbabwe. With ARVs, it means they're now growing up into adulthood and living healthy, normal lives. But young people's success on treatment is reliant on their ability to adhere to medicines every day for life. This is affected by many issues, including the death of parents and siblings, fears for their future, isolation and feeling different from their peers. But hope is not lost, as a group of HIV-positive young people are on the front lines, providing the much-needed peer support, known as CATS. One such young man is Maxwell, who has been living with HIV for the past four years and is passionate about issues others like him face. It's an acronym which stands for Community Adolescent Treatment Supporters. And the kids are peer counsellors who work with the children, adolescents and young people living with HIV, ensuring that they have the appropriate and correct information and providing them, counselling their needs to live happy 
and healthy and fulfill their lives. The cats work alongside the government healthcare workers, bridging the gap with young people and strengthening the national system and response to the emerging, evolving needs of young people living with HIV. We started working with kids that is uh, 2016. Um, the case became a linkage. It has helped erase stigma. When they come for support groups, they were able to understand their own care and they were able to understand that they are not alone. Young people living with HIV used to do much worse than adults on HIV treatment. But this has changed with the CATS program. The health facilities are finding that adolescents are managing to do just as well on treatment and their mental health is also improved. But because they are markets, they are going to change their adherence. So, when they are going to change this program has worked out very well. The adolescents now understand the importance of adherence, and we find that since then, most of them had recovered very well. Antiretroviral treatment can change the life of an adolescent living with HIV, but this medication alone is not enough. This is where the power of the peer comes in, where an adolescent living with HIV is supported by another adolescent living with HIV. Treatment works better in this regard. I offer counseling about my issues. Issues of stigma. Then pan issue we do my support group, facilitate my support group whereby my adolescents are not aware to Ungana to share my issues, to discuss my issues, my topics, my sexual reproductive health. There are currently 1,500 cats across Zimbabwe and another 500 in other countries in the region. If this intervention continues to expand to other parts of the country and region, the program could make a huge difference in adolescents living with HIV. If it's expanded, it will be very helpful to all adolescents and young children living here in Zimbabwe. I think that would be very perfect if it's done. There is an old adage that says, life is like a bicycle. No matter what you face, keep pedaling if you do not want to fall off. If the world adopts and values the contributions of the cats, there's potential to stem the failing trends in adolescent HIV. With more people than ever living with HIV over the age of 50, considering the future of HIV care has never been more important. We met the Gilead Sciences team and people living with HIV to find out why innovation in HIV care is needed for older people to ensure they live long, healthy and independent lives. I believe that I was going to die. It was shocking. Um, now, 18 years later, I'm still alive. Um, you know, I'm growing well, I'm doing all the right things. G-Day was in his 30s when he was diagnosed with HIV. He's living life to the full, but there's concern and uncertainty around growing old. Aging with HIV is a whole different concept in itself. The challenges of getting older with HIV most certainly includes isolation because um, you, you want to be sure that there are people who care for you and understand your needs. There are people who care for you if you have to go into a care home for the elderly. I don't think I know of any specific services um, for people growing older with HIV. And I think that is something that will be on my mind, you know, very soon and should be on, on the mind of service providers as well. It's something that's very much on the mind of the team at Gilead Sciences. Gilead has been working in HIV for the past three decades. And as the first generation of people living with HIV gets older, they're committed to supporting HIV positive patients as they face new challenges of ageing. People living with HIV are subject to the same 
uh, conditions associating with ageing as the general population, um, so these so-called comorbidities, but often they have more of them than the general population and they can tend to affect people living with HIV at an earlier age. So even though treatments have been really highly successful and enabling a generation of individuals living with HIV to head into older age, um, HIV itself is not sorted because we need to think about the complexities of managing those comorbidities and making sure that we've got joined up care so that people ageing with HIV can age well and healthily and have zero difference to the general population in terms of their long-term health outcomes and quality of life. There are 105,000 people living with HIV in the UK. Of these, around 4 in 10 are aged 50 or over. Globally, it's estimated that 70% of people living with HIV will be over 50 years old by 2030. I think we really need to be cognizant within HIV services to not kind of blow that trumpet too much that isn't it great that you're going to live well into your 80s because actually a lot of these people haven't worked for maybe 20 years because they were told there was no need to they don't have savings because they were told to spend them and they don't necessarily have a social network around them either within that we're also seeing those people developing conditions associated with older age Uh, such as cardiovascular disease, uh, bone problems, kidney problems, certain cancers. Gilead's programmes such as HIV Age Positively campaign involves collaborating with innovators, voluntary organisations and future thinkers to design a better present and future for people ageing with HIV. And when it comes to the future, Vanessa is one of many young people facing the challenges of ageing with HIV. Her outlook is positive and she's preparing for older age now, but she's well aware that there are obstacles to overcome. How do you feel about growing older with HIV? Growing with HIV and what the future shaped for me, because I'm someone that once I did come to terms with it, I was like, I want this job, I want to do this and that. There are no limitations in the future for us people with HIV. The only limitation is yourself, to be honest, and with that being said, it's how you come to terms with every aspect of your life and how you deal with every hurdle that comes your way. Joined up care into older age, bringing service providers together, is vital to help those who faced and continue to face the challenges of HIV. It is important to look out for each other, you know, whatever the circumstances we find ourselves. Advances in medicine have enabled many people living with HIV to lead long and healthy lives, but the stigma that they often face still persists. Former Welsh international rugby player Gareth Thomas, in partnership with Vive Healthcare, has launched a new initiative aimed at improving levels of public understanding of HIV and breaking the stigma around it. When a six-foot-three Welsh rugby superstar starts to talk about HIV, people listen. When I look back at when I was first diagnosed um, with HIV and the self-stigma that I had myself and the fact that when somebody told me that I was HIV positive, I thought I was going to die. The fact that I thought I can no longer go near anyone anymore, I can't touch anyone anymore. And that ultimately is why we wanted to set up Tackle HIV because we wanted to give people the correct relevant information for what it's like to live in 2020 with HIV. Vive Healthcare is a pharmaceutical company 100% dedicated to HIV medicines and research and completely focused on people affected by HIV AIDS. Together with Gareth Thomas and charity partner the Terence Higgins Trust, they've launched the Tackle HIV campaign. It was a company 100% focused on HIV. Obviously, our main job is to bring about incredible scientific innovation. But HIV is a disease that everybody has to see in a holistic way. So it's not just about the medication, it's tackling stigma. It's focusing on how you ensure that everybody across the world that is living with HIV has the chance to live a life that's the same as somebody that's not living with HIV. 
I live every single day to try and make other people's lives better, whether that's people's lives I meet or whether that's people's lives I don't meet. To connect with Vive Healthcare, which does exactly the same thing that I get up every morning and strive to do, for me, it's just a natural organisation to pair up with. There are 38 million people on this planet living with HIV. Last year, around 1.7 million people acquired HIV. The team behind Tackle HIV are aiming to challenge public perceptions and tackle misconceptions and stigma around HIV. Vive Healthcare recognises this needs more than just a clinical approach. Science and medicine have come a long way, but changing public attitudes is essential. People who live in fear of HIV may decide not to get tested, or once diagnosed, may not take their medication properly. The, the real resonance about the Tackle HIV campaign is it's really focused on a thing that hasn't changed. Lots has changed about HIV, but stigma is still something that is so negative and impacts negatively uh, on people's lives uh, who are living with HIV. So that's why it's so very, very important. Tackling stigma is a challenge Vive Healthcare has been rising to for more than a decade. As a company that's 100% focused on HIV, we feel a commitment to deliver for people living with HIV not just better medicines, but actually better lives. And so stigma is such a huge issue with HIV. It always, it has been from the beginning. Until we get to a cure, we may not be able to get rid of that stigma. But in the meantime, we're doing everything we can to try to reduce it. In his rugby career, Gareth Thomas never shirked a challenge. Now with Vive Healthcare and the Terence Higgins Trust, he's putting himself on the line once more. Whatever happens in life, you can always make a positive out of it. And that's what I'm doing with Tackle HIV and that's what I'm doing with my life now. From probably the biggest negative I felt I've ever had in my life, I have turned it into being one of the biggest positives. The UN's aim of eradicating the HIV AIDS epidemic by 2030 becomes more achievable if every patient has the viral load in their bloodstream reduced to levels which prevent HIV transmission. Medtech company Hologic is a partner in the Global Access Initiative, which aims to conduct over 1.2 million viral load tests in Africa every year. We went to Kenya to find out how the tests are working to save lives. There are over 38 million people globally living with HIV, and more than two-thirds of them live in Africa. Here in Kenya, nearly 5% of the adult population is living with the virus. Viral load testing, which is routine testing done by laboratories and hospitals to determine the levels of the virus in a patient's bloodstream, is key to tackling the epidemic. MedAccess CEO, Michael Anderson, explains why. First, for the individual, if that individual can get his or her viral load down to a really low level, that means living a life as long and as healthy as someone without HIV. But secondly, and this is critical, that person is then highly unlikely to transmit the virus to someone else, which means that the epidemic will come under control. Formed in 2018, the Global Access Initiative, a partnership between MedAccess the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and med tech company Hologic is working to make this testing more accessible to countries, hospitals, and laboratories around the world. The United Nations has set a goal of ending the HIV AIDS epidemic by the year 2030, but this is only achievable if every HIV positive patient reduces their viral load to levels that are not transmittable. This is only possible with consistent global access to viral load testing, yet only 56% of patients have routine access to it. Jesse Wambugu is the Diagnostic Partnership Leader for Africa for Hologic, the medtech company that has created the Hologic Panther, a high-throughput, fully automated viral load testing instrument that can test up to 750 samples in just 16 hours, is small enough to fit into a standard laboratory, and offers transparent and affordable pricing for its clients. We came into the market with an all-inclusive, transparent pricing, which means when we say to you that we're offering a test at $12 a, a test, 
that $12 covers your instrument placement, um, it covers for your reagents, covers for your consumables, which is something that really wasn't being done. Uh, but over and above that, it covers for your training as well as, as um, your service and maintenance. The reason that having an all-inclusive pricing is important is because it becomes easier for governments um, and financiers and funders um, and partners to budget. They know that, okay, we've got a million people living with HIV AIDS. If we want to test all of them, then it's $12 million uh, per year because they know exactly the cost of, of testing those people, running one viral test um, per year for those patients. The 60 Hologic Panther instruments that are located in countries across Africa are already making a difference in the continent's fight against HIV AIDS. The system helped the country of Zambia completely clear a backlog of 39,000 tests within a month. The Hologic Panther system has transformed the way that HIV viral load testing is done here at the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, a city in western Kenya. Now, technicians at this AMPATH Plus laboratory can test far more samples far more quickly, which improves the turnaround time for patients who are waiting for their results. The benefits of the Panther instrument is that we're able to do more volumes in a shorter period of time. So we're able to improve our turnaround time as a lab. And third, we're able to reduce the number of staff that we use because the system is fully automated. Kadima says that the Hologic Panther instrument has also made a difference in the lives of both doctors and HIV-positive patients in this hospital. So as a facility, we, are, we see a number of patients coming across different parts of the country. So sometimes you get a patient in the ward and they need their results so that the clinician can offer intervention before they go back to where they're coming from. So it's important for us to give that result in the shortest time possible. So with the Panther, we've been able to actually get some of these results to patients who are in the ward before they've been discharged and the clinician is able to intervene in real time. So that's one of our successes with the instrument. The lab staff know that these tests are time sensitive and the people's lives hang on them. You can imagine the reaction among the lab staff and the clinicians, which is they now have the ability to help deliver these uh, test results, which transform people's lives. Undertaking an HIV test can be a long process from taking a blood sample to receiving the results. Intech Products Inc. have partnered with Matrix Diagnostics to distribute point of care HIV tests, providing a fast, accurate and affordable product, helping to prevent the spread of HIV within high-risk groups. Joining me now are Dr. Carve Manavi, consultant physician in HIV medicine, and James Lawson, managing director of Matrix. Dr. Manavi, which groups would you identify as being particularly high risk? I think um, uh, there are certain subpopulations within the UK that carry a higher burden of HIV, men who have sex with men, uh, in people who inject recreational substances. And uh, having the, a test that um, minimizes with the shortest possible turnaround time is essential because uh, if you think about it, uh, an individual would be enabled to know their HIV state at the point of their interaction with clinical setting. So how much was the, the time factor, that lengthy time factor between the test and the result, a prohibitive thing in, in encouraging people to come forward for testing? So you can imagine that a number of people uh, will become very anxious with the whole process of being tested for HIV and the waiting for the result can be quite cumbersome for a number of individuals. Reducing that waiting time is essential. The individual would know their, you know, their HIV serious status quite quickly. In the laboratory-based results, we have to recall the patient to come back to the clinic and then we have to talk to them about the HIV test results and then referral to the centers and so on. So it will significantly reduce the, the process time. James, how has the point of care HIV test changed the way that testing as a whole is, is undertaking? It's obviously very important. The Intech Rapid HIV Test is a powerful tool in the healthcare setting uh, to engage with a patient, 
test and treat them in one appointment rather than have the worry of that, that patient go away after the appointment and worry unnecessarily. And what particular populations have you seen it uh, be most effective in? Uh, one very good example is within the pr uh, prison population where HIV can be prevalent. When the prisoner enters the prison system, they can be tested immediately upon reception and be given the results within 20 minutes. Uh, this obviously has uh, many benefits for the healthcare staff looking after the prisoners. James, how can uh, point of care testing be used for other di diseases? Obviously, it's got huge implications, hasn't it? Yes, in, in bloodborne virus testing as a whole, we test for other uh, diseases such as hepatitis C and hepatitis B. Um, there's a huge campaign globally uh, for the hep C eradication, and these tests are used widely across different disease areas. And of course, people will be interested how, how do you ensure the quality? of uh, PSC tests? When each batch of tests is produced, an independent laboratory in Europe has to do a batch release before the product goes onto the market, just to give everyone that, that extra um, satisfaction, peace of mind that the test functions for every batch. Dr. Manavi, obviously there will be a point at which uh, lessening the time between test and result will mean that you can get to treat patients much more quickly and therefore, I suppose, help eradicate transmission of HIV. You're absolutely correct. And of course, we have got plenty of data from the UK and globally that individuals with uh, treatment and undetectable viral load count cannot pass it on to other people through sex. So therefore, earlier diagnosis will result in curbing their transmission. What kind of difference will it make? We do have evidence that uh, treatment of individuals living with HIV can reduce the rate of transmission to less than 1%. James, how optimistic are you that you can roll this out uh, at the speed necessary to achieve uh, targets from the HIV Commission? The product has been widely used in the UK and has been for a few years now. But we're very, very upbeat about the prospect of rolling this out across the UK. Thank you both very much for joining me. Goodbye. Millions of HIV tests are carried out worldwide every year and prevention efforts to end the HIV epidemic are working. However, there is still a significant number of people infected with HIV who are unaware of their status. Orishore Technologies has developed an oral self-test that has had successful results in the US and Africa and will soon be available in Europe, offering a private and pain-free route for individuals who may not want to go to a clinic to check their HIV status. Taking an HIV test at home offers privacy, convenience and confidentiality. And now that a test can detect antibodies on the gum line, there's no need to draw blood or send it off to a lab. With the OraQuick oral swab test, the result is available in just 20 minutes. The test from Orishore Technologies was the first HIV self-test to be approved by America's FDA and the first to be pre-qualified by the World Health Organization. It's highly accurate and it will give you the result very quickly without the need of, of pricking your finger or, um, or giving blood. The other advantage is there's no virus in the mouth. You can't catch HIV from kissing. So there's no contaminated material during the, the, the process of testing. So the test is very safe. The HIV self-test allows individuals who may not wish to go to a clinic um, to obtain a test at home, test themselves in private, and if they are positive, they can then seek out additional testing, confirmatory testing, uh, and linkage to care and get the treatment that they need to keep themselves healthy and live a normal life. It was in Malawi, central southern Africa, that pilot studies and ethical assessments were carried out on the OraQuick test. The success of this pioneering work was a career highlight for Professor Liz Corbett. People find it extremely empowering to be able to access 
um, a test conveniently when they need it. Um, it's the only time I've ever seen like big smiles when when people don't normally smile when they think about HIV testing. But with self-testing, really, that meets demand. We achieved really high uptake in some very difficult groups that are hard to reach otherwise, so adolescents and older people who, for various reasons, feel reluctant to test through standard facilities. Everyone just so delighted, suddenly this worry taken away. In the UK, at least 12 people are diagnosed with HIV every day. It's estimated that 103,800 people in the UK are living with HIV, of which one in 14 remain undiagnosed. Access to a mouth swab self-test could increase the numbers who get diagnosed and so get access to potentially life-saving treatment. Although Britain has significantly reduced the incidence of HIV, even surpassing the UN's targets, experts warn against complacency. Bringing the HIV oral self-test to Britain and Europe will offer earlier diagnosis, a cut in transmission rates and another option to check HIV status. Stigma still exists with HIV, but in the United Kingdom and Europe, we are very lucky to have a strong infrastructure to look after those who are at risk and those who live with HIV. We'll be working with sexual health providers, HIV charities and pharmacies to make sure that anybody who wishes to test themselves with a HIV self-test that is based on oral fluid can do just that. Anyone needing support before, after or even while taking a self-test can find it at the Terence Higgins Trust. Self-testing complements existing face-to-face -face testing services in sexual health clinics, primary care and community-based settings. And it just offers more choice to people. So if they can't get it one way, they can get it another way. We've also done a lot of great work trialing whether doing assisted self-testing is an option to give people that confidence. So the bottom line is just as much choice as possible. Choice, simplicity, convenience, especially at a time when normal health facilities may be harder to access. The first HIV oral self-test coming to Britain will help more people be sure of their HIV status and, if positive, seek the care they need. We hope you enjoyed the programme Health and HIV. Please visit the British HIV Association website for more information. The details are on the screen now. From me and the team here at ITN Productions, thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>